Better. So it's okay. Don't worry, because I was having I was having technical crap at this end as well. So uh, the universe is in is in resonance. I think we can safely say. <laughs> so. So how are we organizing this thing? Do you just kind of shout questions, hopefully, at me, and or <laughs> is there somebody out there uh, organized with a microphone or what? We have a microphone. Um, I think here you can see it right there. <laughs> okay, cool. Also, I'm holding your camera, so my apologies if it is uh, a little bit. Ooh, hang on a sec. We might have a recording problem. No, that's uh, just gonna. Okay, right. never mind. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, my apologies if it's a little bit like wobbly. Uh, no problem. Basically, what we're gonna do is because of the time lag, we're going to have people come up one by one, ask you a question, and then we will all be very quiet while you answer, so we can all hear. Um, and then yeah, okay. we'll just do that. And I think that I will be calling on people. So if you are ready, oh, I do want to show you. I'm set. Let's go. We have a cosplayer row right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey guys. Hey, 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 <laughs> some of these, some of these I've seen already because I was cruising the Tumblr last night. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, Peter has a message for Shannon. I have to make sure she gets it later on. Uh, the, the great cry of let's build a trebuchet. Um, <laughs> he has plans up in his office for a mini trebuchet called Cheese Chucker, um, which is designed to hurl mini Baby Bell cheeses <laughs> at people you feel the need to throw cheese at. <laughs> and it's, it's very cute. I, I must get him to link to it because it's fabulous stuff. Anyway. So, all right. I saw the first hand way in the back over here. Very ready. Why should have people line up? For the mic? Yeah, do we want to just line yeah. up right here? Yeah. Or would we be ready? Yeah. If you do that, sit so people can feel yeah, it. Yeah. I feel like, like he might have the entire room in the center aisle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it might work better just to call on people. All right. Yeah. We'll just call. That's fine. <laughs> or maybe okay. have like. Like, Whatever works. Yeah. No, one or two people wait until there's always well, a like, rally. Right. Right. We'll just call on people. Okay. It's good. Let's let's just uh yeah. Okay. Caitlin. Hi, nice to meet you. Um <laughs> Hey. You um when uh last night we were on the Wayback Machine a lot, attempting to find old young wizards things. Uh and one we mm. found Peter Murray's original timeline. That's still on the Wayback Machine. Oh. Which I was super glad about. I was anxious I would never see it again. <laughs> Um, but one thing we could I think I actually have a copy of it. I, I, you know, looking forward to things doing what they do on the web. I, I archived everything I could find, yeah. <laughs> and it's buried somewhere in the hard drive. And that's one of my questions is, Wizards on Call, FanLib is not on the Wayback Machine. And Interesting. And I was wondering if you have a copy of Wizards on Call, and if there's any news regarding the short story short circuit that was supposed to be related to that. There's no news immediately, as as usual. Unfortunately, paying work is is getting in the way. Um, it's it's such a nuisance, you know, having to to feed the transport and the husband's transport and you know, God knows what else. Um, it's in the background. You know, I have a large heap of Young Wizards Associated stuff that. In you know moments when I have a spare second or so to rub together, I, I go through the heap and look at it and then sigh deeply and, and usually move on. Um, the fan lib thing that was an incredible mess, and I could see where that could have gone. Uh, but the minute the company started to change its nature into a a method of monetizing fan work. Uh, I started getting very creepy about that. I, I really didn't care for it. And so I thought maybe it's best to step away. And when it became clear to me, because I, I went to them for a quote, and I said, how much do we need to use your platform to make this thing happen? And when they started quoting me amounts in the five figures, I sort of said, no, no, you don't, under you don't understand. You're supposed to pay me. <laughs> And somebody at that end of things seemed to be unclear on the concept. <laughs> so I thought it was probably just best to step away. Um, I'm sure I still have the material because I'm, 
I'm really terrible about about online content. I archive everything. Nothing is ever completely lost. My hard drive is like, you know, yeah. 12 feet deep in ancient files. I would have to go looking. And of course, the problem is now, uh, I, you know, like many other people, Charlie Strauss and various others, the sight of Microsoft Word makes me throw up a little bit in my mouth. Um, <laughs> and so all the files that I did with Word I have to go digging for them now because they, you know, I just, I just hate using word at all. I've, I've turned into a complete scrivener slut. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just know that anyway, so in brief, it's probably still, I'm, I'm sure I've got it around somewhere. It's just been ages since I looked at it. Okay. Well, I'm glad that that's the fact because I was worried that was lost too. And just know that if you ever decide to post it, it will be greatly appreciated. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. If, if I find it, because it's the kind of thing I have no problem with, you know, sort of pulling this out of the vault and saying here, you know, and just shoving it up there and saying, let people look at it and, you know, make what they can of it. Uh, the short circuit story proper um, I may yet complete. It's entirely possible I'll break it out as, as an interim errand tree. Um, vol well, it would have to be a volume because I was always expecting that it was going to go, you know, 70, 80,000 words. So, you know, something else to do when I have a few minutes to rub together. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure, no problems. Sorry. Oh, that's a good thing. Oh, no. All good. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I had a question. Hey. <laughs> is Irene Earth's plan planetary a single mother? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to be able to give simple declarative answers. And that's just the way it turned out. I, I you know, um, God knows why. Doubtless we'll hear her story eventually, but uh, that's, that's all I know about it at the moment. Okay. Hi. Hey. Um, so I actually have a two-part question. First one, this is actually in reference to Dark Mirror instead of Young Wizard. Okay. Um, is sure. Hui or and Hotshot based off of each other? Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. They, they are, see, so much for the simple declarative answers. Um, go not to the writer for, you know, advice because she will say no and yes and do I have the slightest idea. Um, they are related in some obscure manner. Uh, whether they're actually identical is another question. Okay. Uh, it depends on whether or not I think Paramount will sue me this week. <laughs> because okay. this week, who knows? You know, I'll, I'll, let's, let's put it this way. The BBC was very kind not to sue, to sue me for stealing the doctor. Um, I got away lucky with that one. Um, so, you know, but you can't guarantee things anymore. It was a kinder time. Okay. So. And, and the second question. In Dark Mirror, I'm sorry for those who haven't read it. Read it. I'm going to try to keep it as spoiler-free as possible. Um, there was a sure. period of time where he was very distressed. And he's singing part of the song of the twelve, which he said he found. Sure. What part was that? Like, I've, it, it's always. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Sometimes this stuff just comes up in the middle of something you're writing, and you know, you look at that and go, "I wonder which bit." I can't. I have no idea. Let's just move on because uh, you know it, it was that that book was a bit rushed, as as was Spock's world. God knows. I've had so many people this weekend saying, you know, Spock's world, this is, you could have called it Vexit. <laughs> <laughs> and they're saying, look, there are all these resonances. And I'm going, yeah, that's a bit creepy, you know. Um, I don't like being quite that predictive. I understand that science fiction is, you know, meant to do that to a certain level, but mm, this, this whole week has been very peculiar. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Uh, hello. Um, Hi. I actually have a question about some of about one of the changes in the new Millennium Edition. Uh, I was, sure. I was wondering, at the end of High Wizardry, um, in the original one, uh, it, it was like some something regarded to Olber's paradox and like actually holding the universe still. 
And I thought that yeah. was so much more badass than what it was changed to, and I wanted to know why that was. Uh, I changed it because I got the math wrong. <laughs> uh, I sat down with um, an astronomer who was better able to tease out what I was doing there, and he just looked at me and he said, let me put this for you as simply as I can. It doesn't work. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, try, try it a little less simply. And he said, okay. And he then spoke to me in tongues for about, about five minutes. <laughs> and, you know, I understood then why I was not meant to be an astrophysicist, not a real one. <laughs> uh, when the professionals take the time to explain kindly and slowly to you in words of like one and a half syllables that, you know, it's just not working. Uh, you know, I, I had to have, he, he convinced me, he made his case convincingly and I had to say myself, all right, it, it's got to, I've got to do something else. And that, that's just the way it went. So you just chose. I calls him as I sees him. So you just chose something relatively similar in effect or. That was that was the general idea. I want, you know, it's a big call to slow down the entire universe. I know that's universe. why I loved it so much. <laughs> but, you know, and I loved it too when I wrote it. And then I looked at it a little bit later, and I, mm. and it just, you know, then then the chap I was talking to put it to me as I say in in simple terms, and I went, mm, okay. Uh, you have confirmed something that I was already thinking. So let, let's shift it and move on. So I did. All right. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, I have a question. In the most recent one, games we could play, we see the planets like come and visit. So, And they're referred to planetaries, and then Irina is also referred to as the planetary. So I was just wondering what the difference between yeah. the two was. There's no difference. It is It is the being or sentient that that manages an entire planetary body one way or another. It can be a member of one of the dominant species. It may be the body itself, mm -hmm. um, as it would be with Saturn and Jupiter. Um, it varies. I mean, there are some planets that are managed by uh, beings of species that don't actually even live there. Um, there's a page about it in, in the Errantry Wiki, so you might want to okay. check that out because it spells some of this out. Sure. Hello, my name's Andy. I don't know, hey. people aren't Hi. themselves to you. Yeah. It's good to meet you. Um, so I had a question. So You Want to Be a Wizard was one of the first few books that you ever published. And obviously for, yes. for most writers, uh, it may not be the case that 33 years later, there's a huge fandom around <laughs> one of your earlier books. So my question is. I love the word huge. Well, <laughs> That's very sweet. <laughs> But, it, well, anyway, uh, at what point did you realize that the Young Wizard series was going to be a thing? And was there an event or a point in time when you realized, oh, this is really taking hold and growing and, you know, be becoming a bigger thing than just a, a few novels here and there? And what, like, what event was it that told you that? And what was your reaction? Um, I think when the books got bought again. After they, they didn't actually go out of print. They didn't quite have time. But there was a point when Dell, Delacorte, decided that it was going to throw all its mid-list writers off a cliff. All right? So I went off the cliff. Jane Yolen. They threw Jane Yolen off the cliff. All right? This is an act of, of massive folly that, that I can't begin to describe to you. Anyway, <laughs> so... The books stayed in paperback at Dell for a couple of years, and during that period, Jane went to Harcourt Brace, as it then was, and started the Magic Carpet line of, of young adult science fiction and fantasy, and she bought the books in. That was the point where I realized that something was going on here, because... Um, Usually, when a, when a series is on the point of going out of print, it does not get bought up unless it has good sales figures and people like the writing enough that they think that they can keep selling it. And, you know, I, I had kind of become resigned to maybe these are going to go away and I need to be writing something else now. Um, and then, you know, Harcourt came along and I went, oh, 
okay. And uh, Jane said, so where do you want to go now? And that was um, around then. Uh, I said, well, why don't you take the fourth book, which interestingly was published in the UK before it was published in the States, um, because I was in a deal at Corgi Transworld at that point, and they said, okay, we'll publish your adult fantasy, and oh, well, these kids' books, we'll take them too. And I said, fine, I'll do you another one then, because A Wizard Abroad had been, you know, cooking for a while. Um, and that's the way it went. Then, you know, Jane bought the first four and, uh, my new editor after her, Michael Stearns really got behind them and pushed and the books began to really sell. And this was just before Joe Rowling. All right. Just that much before. So it was at that point that I realized that, okay, um, this is something we can keep doing for a while. I'd always hoped it would. But, you know, your hopes and your publisher's intentions don't always mesh. So you have to you have to keep an open mind. This is the chanciest, most, you know, bizarre and unpredictable day job to have in the world. No one knows why anything becomes successful. It's just like the movies, except, you know, with paper. No one knows why. No one has a clue. And things will, you know, take off and do really well for a while and then slope off again. And again, no one will understand why. Um, you know, it happens. But either way, I'd say that was the point when Harcourt bought the books again or not, you know, bought the books off, off Dell or off me. Um, that would have been the indicator. All right. So. Well, thank you. And please never die. <laughs> uh, from your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> Assuming, assuming we can keep this bit working, you know, the, that's that's always a, a bit of a challenge. Mm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, sorry, she was talking. Um, okay. I'm Tessa. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, I understand if you can't answer this directly, but if you can't, then just talk about something about it. Um, <laughs> In high wizardry, it's implied that the Doctor and Darth Vader are real people. Do do we take that to mean that like those three stories actually share the same universe, or is it like the Star Wars movies and the Doctor Who show are based on a true story and not really literally true? No, they, it, they those shows exist in that universe, um, and given. You know, multiverse theory as we understand it, it's entirely possible. And I'm, I, you know, Stephen Hawking says it, so it must be true <laughs> uh, that such characters actually physically exist somewhere. Obviously, not in this bubble of space time, but somewhere else, simply because we imagined them. Now, I, I have to confess, you know, that that idea has its attractions, <laughs> um, and maybe that's what we're seeing there. I mean, you know, they're there because I wanted them to be there. You know, it, it's really. This is this is what this level of storytelling is about, really, that, you know, you get to be God. I get to say, lo, it is so. And I don't have to explain it. It's brilliant. <laughs> Except at times like this. <laughs> at which point, being God and going, lo, then you find out, wait a minute, they're asking me questions. What do I do now? <laughs> so you see why being a deity is, is quite, uh, the word for this weekend is fraught. It's very fraught. Um, they're there. You know, if they are real, it's because they are real somewhere else. And that reality is, as it were, slopping over into this one. Um, did that make any sense whatsoever? Uh, yeah, that's actually a really interesting idea. <laughs> okay. We'll go and think about that now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey. Alliteration. Um, hopefully this is a somewhat easy question for you to answer. In uh, both A Wizard Abroad and more recently Games Wizards Play, we've gotten hints that wizardry runs in families. And um, mm. one of your newest characters is from a wizarding family. Um, can you tell us about the proportion of wizards who are born into wizard families or wizards who uh, have no experience before their ordeal? Uh, and if it's a genetic or a social thing that they're uh, they're suited to wizardry because they're around it? 
I don't think it's genetic, at least in the, under, in the way we understand genetics. Um, that said, the way we understand genetics is changing all the time. We're now starting to see suggestions that people's ancestors' experiences can somehow be echoed in the DNA of their descendants. And it's very peculiar. You know, we don't know why that would be. The, the mechanism that would determine that is, is at the moment unimaginable. Uh, I wouldn't put it past the powers that be to exploit that mechanism in some ways. Uh, and that said, it, it, what, what's probably true about it is that the, the ability to be a wizard may run more strongly in some families than others. And it may be a matter of agreement or, you know, something similar, just that, you know, you believe in such a thing and it could happen. Uh, But at the same time, there is no guarantee that anyone's going to be a wizard unless they are offered the opportunity. And whether or not that's going to happen to them, you know, no one knows. Uh, one of the characters in uh, Inner Amerantry is in a situation where, or Inner Amerantry 2, is in a situation where the fact that wizardry runs in the family, it's almost a given that everyone will be a wizard, and to be the one who isn't one yet becomes incredibly stressful. Um, and you know, there's just no guarantee. He, you know, he hasn't been offered the oath. He has no idea what's the matter with him because there seems to be the sense, you know, that that no one's actually saying it, that something's the matter with him. Um, okay. I'm noticing that the, the display has just frozen. Are we still live at your end or? Yeah. 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 You're a little choppy. Is the, uh, the system having a fit? Uh, you're a little choppy in terms of video, but the audio is fine. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay, let me just, I, I've got a couple things online here. Just give me two seconds while I take these guys offline to make sure that they're not uh, interfering anyway with the broadband because it's been fairly steady so far. Um, if I need to break off and call you back, I'll do that. Okay, sounds good. Um, let me just, let me just... Take these, take these guys offline here. Okay, now you're all moving again. So, so. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so anyway, in in brief, uh, you know, the the tendency may run in families, but there's no guarantee that anyone's going to be a wizard unless they're actually offered the opportunity, and no one knows why that happens. There are some studies in. Interim Tree too, as we look at these three or four ordeals, it might be four, I'm not sure yet, that uh, the powers themselves are not sure whether to do it. Uh, because all the time they're rolling the dice, uh, granting you that a given wizard may be the answer for a specific question at a given moment in time. The question then arises, yeah, but what else are they good for? Because you're investing a lot of time and energy in handing them the, uh, the ability to be able to be a wizard. So you're looking at a lifetime commitment. Will they commit? You know, for how long? What will happen to them if they do? Even the powers that be, because we're, you know, you're, they're sampling into a timeline that, that is less central to them. Um, they can't always predict what's going to happen. There's this weird persnickety thing called free will. You know, and and who knows what a wizard's going to do. You have to, you pull the trigger, you see what happens. You know. So anyway, was that, was that answered enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Rosemary. And. Hi. Hi. (laughs) Uh, so, as someone who's been involved in fandom for kind of a very, quite a while, from Star Trek sure. and everything like that, and then so you you sort of started out being a fan and you kind of got involved in creating with the Star Trek and stuff like that, and now you're sort of finding yourself in the position of being, I'm not saying in charge of us, because that implies that we're that organized, but having a Do I level... look like I have the superpower of herding cats? 
<laughs> well, I could almost see it. It's but, okay. No. But but how is that yeah. sort of been from being kind of the fan to the creator? And obviously there's a lot of interplay there, but how is that kind of been from being the person who was the fan to being the creator to being the creator who all the fans are looking at is the person who created the thing? And kind of how is that, and interacting with those fans, and sort of how has that been? Weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not, maybe not that weird. I mean, the, the thing is that one advantage of being, having been in fandom for a long time and watch, having had a chance to watch the way relationships shift over sometimes decades, um, it takes some of the shock out of it when, when it starts happening to you because you're, you know, if, if you're a writer and if you're doing it for long enough and your stuff has at least a, you know, sort of a basic level of, of, uh, visibility sooner or later, it's going to happen and, uh, you will acquire a fandom and, you know, there are numerous ways to handle this. You can, and forgive me for not actually mentioning any names here, but you can go completely bug fuck and, uh, you know, attempt to be mistress of all you survey and order people around and tell them what to do. Good luck with that. Um, you can have, uh, you know, uh, noisy meltdowns <laughs> in, in social media when people don't behave the way you want them to. Uh, you can uh, hide under a rock and have no you know, connection with them at all. Um, you can sort of barge through every fourth wall you run into and pick fights with people. Um, there are a lot of different ways it can go. And, you know, in some cases, it's going to be about how much the writer makes at what they're doing. Extremely successful writers seem to fall into either the you know, good natured, mild toned school or the, I am coming out from under my rock to pick a fight with you now. And here is my lawyer. <laughs> uh, and frankly, some of them have not done themselves a favor by doing that. And so when you have leisure to watch all this unfolding, you know, sometimes, you know, wanting to hug the person very much and sometimes wanting to, you know, just sit them down on a, on a, hard chair and have a difficult talk with them about who the hell they think they are actually. Um, you can make, you know, or attempt to make rules for yourself as to what you're not going to do ever. If you're sane, <laughs> you know, really, if you have any, any fondness for your career or, or for the feelings of the people around you who admire what you do, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the wisest thing is, you know, Will Wheaton's great law, don't be a dick. I mean, <laughs> really, to, uh, to the people around you. Uh, granted that a lot of us are sometimes pushed over the edge by something that happens online. Uh, myself, I really try to stay out of that mode. And, and so I, I slip occasionally, but uh, I, try, I try to be good. Uh, because, you know, you, there are moments when you wake up in the middle of the night and, you know, realize that there are people out there who actually think that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's kind of shocking sometimes, you know, you, you, you stand up in front of a room and, you know, you get a standing ovation or, you know, you, you open the email and you get yet another email that says you changed my life forever and here is how. And all you can do, I think, is sit there and be astounded and, and often humbled by how it's possible to affect people's lives at such a distance. And, and it sort of behooves you to, you know, concentrate on being good about it insofar as you can. Um, and as I say, all of us are tempted. And uh, there are moments where, you know, rage tweeting over something is, is very, very tempting. Um, and you have to sort of pull back. At least I have to kind of pull back and say, no, who is served by this? I mean, you get to have your little rant and, you know, that's okay. But if, God forbid, you should hurt somebody's feelings, you really don't want to do that. Life is too short. So it, it can be strange. It can be extremely peculiar. Um, but 
time makes it easier to deal with it. Um, and you know, I, I have the fortune of good fortune of having a lot of friends who weren't anybody in particular to start with and then became massively famous and sometimes insanely wealthy. And the pleasure of watching it not spoil them. Uh, you know, Peter and I used to hang around in the bar with Terry Pratchett before he was Terry Pratchett. Um, you know, he's eaten in our house. We've, you know, driven him around Dublin. We've been to his place, uh, you know, in the ancient day. Ron Moore is a good buddy. I, you know, once we all got caught in the rain together and he and Peter wound up drying their hair down under a hairdryer in the men's room. I mean, <laughs> the man who, you know, now is story running Outlander. And it's really inspiring to know people who have been through this thing where, you know, the, the focus that is brought to bear on them is 50 times worse than I've ever had. And yet they maintain their equilibrium. So it's, you know, it's good to have good examples around you to, to help you just remember on, on mornings when you get up with a swelled head, because sometimes you do, you know, uh, there are moments in, in particular as regards Star Trek. I'm, I'm sorry, but there are days, you know, someone says to me, you know, could you do that? And I say, are you kidding? I'm fucking Diane Dwayne. Of course I can do that. <laughs> yeah. And with Trek, I think I've proven, I, I have a tra- track record in Trek that I think it's fair to say that. Uh, elsewhere, you know, you, you approach projects with, with fear and trembling and you go, my God, can I pull this off? Um, no, I can't tell you about the thing that's going on right now, but you know, it's one of those things where people approach you and pay you money and they say, we want you to do this thing. And you go, wow, you're asking me for this, you know? And then you, you, you say, you, you, you make adult noises, right? You say all the right things and you say, you know, you'll talk to my agent, of course, and we'll sort this out. And then you go into your hotel room or wherever and you shut the door and you put your back up against it and you shake and you say, what did I just agree to do? Future generations are going to snicker at the sight of the initials DD. You know, <laughs> I'm doomed. You know, and we all have moments like that. And th- those are actually good. It, it's, it's kind of cleansing to have moments like that and uh, let the universe remind you forcibly that, you know, people may have faith in you and that that's really cool when they do. Um, but at the end of the day, you are, no matter how gifted an artist you may be, or writer, or musician, or whatever, you are still fallible. You are hooked up to this transport that, uh, you know, has strange chemical reactions that can't always be predicted. And you better behave. You better behave. So, so anyway, it's peculiar, but I, but I manage. Thank you, in just like multiple dimensions. <laughs> sure, no problems. Mm. Hey. Sadly, shortly followed, you know, shortly following the sister. <laughs> In terms of cosplay, um, I was wondering um, two things. One's a little shorter. Um, okay, see now, now I'm losing my words. Um, right. Uh, it's okay. I've seen a couple of times in other works uh, quiet references to things you have written. And I'm wondering what your opinion of such things are. And I, I, I recognize, I, I think I know already because you stole the doctor. <laughs> but uh, it's someone who looks a real lot like him, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just curious what your um, what your take on that is for other people doing it to you. Um, and then if you have any plans of intro- I haven't read Games Wizards Play, so maybe I'm missing something, but I was wondering if you have any plans of introducing canon uh, transgender characters. Ah, um, I don't see why I shouldn't. The thing about that being that I need to be a lot more educated on the whole subject than I am right now. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to approach that with caution when I get there. Um... The thing I'm eager to avoid, because God knows I've been accused of it a couple times, uh, and this happened, you know, because of games people, uh, games wizards play, um, is being a member of the um, uh, diverse character of the month club, 
that, you know, pe- people saying, yeah, you put so-and-so in there just so that you will be cool and on point with the whole diversity thing. And I'm going, no, I put that person in there because I'm on Tumblr and everyone's beating me over the head saying, put them in there. <laughs> <laughs> it is stupid not to listen to your audience. And, and the, the other side of it is that because you can't be, you know, completely slavish about this stuff. You, you know, fine. It's it's good to be ordered to put something in there, and with good reason. I mean, representation representation matters. But at the same time, you've got to put them in there in such a way that it's plain they belong there. Uh, you can't just shove somebody into a slot and say, fine, you you go there, and you know, you don't have to do anything now. You just you know, haha, I've 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 committed fan service, and now I'm going to run away. Um, they have to have a reason to be there. They have to have a continuing reason to be there. So I'm not going to be introducing characters who are not going to play a further role in the narrative. Um, granted it's a very, you know, big narrative and there's all these people running around loose now and that that's great. Let it be large. You know, it gives us, gives us more room to, uh, splash around. Now, what was the first bit again? Uh, the thing about references to your own work. In other works. Mm. Mm. Um, well, unless I actually read them, I'm not likely to know about them. Um, I mean, you know, look, why shouldn't people, you know, quote my tropes if they like? Um, you know, how am I supposed to stop them exactly? <laughs> <laughs> also fair. You know, why, why? it's like I need to clone myself to roll up to the doors of all the people who are going to quote myself and say, I forbid you. It's like, oh, yeah, that's going to go far. <laughs> so, no, uh, you know, let them let them do what they do. If, if if I can make a difference to somebody else's written work, that's cool. Let them get on with it. And, um, you know, that'll be fine. Sure. Hi, I'm Roger. Since- Hiya. The series has spanned so much of your career as a novelist. How have you balanced the way you've grown and changed as a writer with consistency in storytelling style within a series? With great difficulty. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, every writer reads their early stuff and goes, oh my God. <laughs> You know, and sometimes it's not about the plot being off or, you know, the characters being incorrect or anything like that. It's just you look back at your previous work and you go, "Mm, God, that could have been better. I see where I was trying to go with that. And it didn't it didn't come off. Um, And short of actually going back and revising the books, which God knows (laughs) we've been there. Um, even then you can only do so much there, there becomes an issue of not fixing what's not broken. And, you know, there are some things, the tone of which made a given work for people. And, and so you, you move gently, you try to fix the things that really seem to need fixing without overly altering the things that are okay from, from the perspective of, you know, two or three decades down the road. And it's like playing one of those pull the sticks out games. What's the name of that game? I always forget. Yeah, it's, it's like that. You really need to be cautious because alter one thing and everything else in the pile shifts. And if it all falls over because you've altered something vital, then you're very, very screwed. Um, and it, it's tough to do. And tone is particularly an issue. Um, it's hard. It's hard. You, you, you call every sentence, every paragraph on a case-by-case basis. You look at it and you say, hmm, does this do what I meant it to do? And how do I get it to mean what I meant it to do with as, by doing as little violence to the, the structure as possible? Um, and there are some things you can't fix, ideally, and you just leave them be. Uh, and again, you know, the artist has to make that judgment moment by moment on, you know, on whatever amount of brains they have working that day. Sometimes a fair amount, sometimes. Mm. <laughs> so uh, it, it's not tough. It, it, it's, it's tough, but, you know, I do what I can. 
Hi, I'm Jules. Um, speaking Hi. back to old books, you've kind of become known by this point for having long foreshadowing arcs, sometimes two or three books in advance. <laughs> um, yeah. Or five or, <laughs> or six. Five or six, or <laughs> introducing kernels all the way back in the beginning with the Book of Night with Moon, God only knows. Um, are you wow. that much of a <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a fan theory. I don't know. <laughs> um, do you plan things that far back? Or are you simply very good at taking old canon and going, oh, I can twist this and make it work? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it goes, it does go both ways. I have, there's one arc that's going to pay off in book 11 that has been hanging since book one. Oh. And I def and I def I'm not going to say I defy you to tell me what it, I, I'm I, I'm going to do it in a way that I think people won't expect, which is which is fine when I finally you know pull that gun down off the wall and fire it. Um, but it's it's a problem that becomes obvious in book one that has never been discussed ever ever ever, and that one was a I'm looking back on this, you know, around book six or seven, it would have been. I looked back and I said, you know, I see an opportunity here. I see something that has not been handled. So let me let me deal with that. In the shorter term, yes, I do plan them. I do plant stuff. I plant it with extreme prejudice. I am a serial outliner. And I have no, no patience with pantsing. You know, I, I understand that whole school of thought, but my, my early structural training is as a screenwriter and screenwriting has no room for pantsing. You cannot do that. It, it's a it's simple economic fact that when you sit down, when you pitch an animated episode of something or, you know, uh, back in the day when you pitch live action, they want to see it on paper. The people are, who are going to pay you ridiculous amounts of money want to see on paper everything you're going to do um, in, at a level of detail that is appropriate each time for the thing you're about to be doing. And that, that whole school of looking at plotting sank very deeply into me from the beginning. And so there it is. Um, you know, I write... 60 page outlines and there's stuff in there that if it doesn't get used in this book, I have a little pile. I put things on. I say, we'll come back to you in like book 10 or 15 or thereabouts. And uh, I never throw anything away. And uh, I do leave these things around. You know, sometimes I'll just drop five or six different things in a book and wait to see which one I'm really interested in connecting up to further dots down the line two or, th two or three books along. I'm a bad girl. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> very, very Thank brilliant. you. Um, how far out do you have outlined right now, book-wise? Um, here's the thing. I mean, the, the issue right now with the, the sort of main sequence of the Young Wizards books is the characters are aging up into what we are referring to generally now as new adult. Um, I already know what the first three new adult books are going to look like. The question is, when am I going to find time to write these and will the same publisher be interested in publishing them or am I going to have to take that to a different publishing house? I don't know. So that that's quite uncertain, but I have at least broad strokes outlined for the first three of a, of a new adult sequence. And in the main sequence we're working on now, um, we're plotted through book 12 anyway, and there's some loose stuff that's going to depend on how the timing goes and what Harcourt wants to do and about 12 other things that I don't understand fully at the moment. So anyway, there's more. There's more coming. There's no problem with, oh, plot. Oh, dear. Thank you. Dear. Sure. We're in no danger of running out of stories. I'm here to tell you that. So. Hello. My name is Michaela. Hi. Hi. 
Um, so several questions ago now, you mentioned the thank you notes that you get from fans, but I was wondering if there's anything in particular that fans do or can do that you find particularly supportive um, for yourself or for what you want your books to do in the world or things that just amuse you <laughs> that we can keep doing to amuse you. <laughs> Buying the ebooks. <laughs> That's really useful. I still have not been able to get my new glasses <laughs> because something else came along and ate the money that was supposed to go for them. Uh, yeah, I mean, that. Um, other than that, just, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, it, it, it's fun. It, it's, it's very enjoyable to have, you know, first of all, to be welcome enough in the fan space that people don't sort of scream at you to get out because their their fragile fourth wall is crumbling under the assault of your vast whatever um, <laughs> you know and I, occasionally occasionally you know somebody somebody accuses you of, of uh, brutalizing them by having the nerve to actually be a writer and express an opinion about what you really meant about something mm. terrible god forbid I should have an opinion uh, <laughs> Just do what you're doing. You're, everybody's fine. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Erin. Hi. Hey. This, this is a weird moment. <laughs> um, my question is one that you may not be able to answer because God knows what you have planned in the future, but um, throughout the books we've seen a lot of the expression of the kind of tenet of wizardry. Um, wizardry does not live in the unwilling heart. And maybe you have plans for that in the future, but I guess I was wondering if you could kind of maybe like expand on like what kind of the consequences of that might be. Because we, we see in Deep Wizardry that Nita is told by Carl, if you break your word here, you're going to lose your wizardry and any memory that you have of your wizardry. But would those kind of consequences be the same for someone who gave up their wizardry willingly? It's going to, you're going to have to judge it on a case by case basis, I think. You know, everybody's circumstances are going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be, that would be one of the things, for example, that Short Circuit was meant to handle. Mm -hmm. um, as we deal in more detail with a wizard who is drifting away from her art for personal reasons. Uh, it doesn't always go out with a bang, sometimes it goes out with a whimper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, People's brains change, people's minds change, their emotional landscape changes. There may be people, you know, who just find wizardry too intense. There are probably people it burns out. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, you're given to understand when, you know, you, you accept the oath that this is a possibility. It can happen. It's one of the, one of the possible dangers. Mm -hmm. If you accept, then you've accepted that that could happen. Yeah, it's going to look different every time. As I say, until I actually sit down and write another example of that, um, I, I can't give you an answer on what that looks like in detail. Okay. Um, anyway. Thank you. Okay, sure. <coughs> Hi again, it's Holland. Um, hey. Hello. Um. Two things, one, spoilers for Games Wizards play here, but I did kind of make a bet with the fandom that if Roshan came back before I finished my doctorate, I'd get a Young Wizards tattoo, so now I have to figure out what exactly I'm going to get on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, hey, you win. Um, secondly, okay. As, um, well, your, your work is the whole reason I'm in my particular field and one of the reasons I wanted to go to grad school and sustainability, so hey. Um, the other thing, I have a question. What decides if a species is sentient enough to have wizards? I mean, we know Ponch sort of opened the door for canine wizards. We know there's feline wizards. But, you know, we just found out that birds have more brain per square centimeter of brain than humans. Are there... Yeah. Wizards? Are, there are there octopus wizards? Tell me there are octopus yes. wizards. <laughs> <laughs> or is there a certain level of... That'd be kind of cool. Is, there a certain, is it not just intelligence, but also a certain level of sociality that's required... For wizardry, I'm just curious because you're going to write would, millions, but I'm curious about like here. I would guess, I would guess sociality would count. I mean, when when I first started toying with the concept, it was basically the higher up the food chain you were, huh. the more likely you would be a wizard. 
um, because well, just because of reasons. I mean, yeah, it just seemed yeah. to be the way to go with it. Um, I I can't see any argument against octopus wizards. I think that yeah. actually sounds kind of cool. Um, I don't see why not. Corvids. I I think that you know there have to be. Well, we we've got some canon on that already, but you know, so smart, such smart birds. Um, I don't know who else might follow him, but the um, the Yeoman Raven Master of the Tower has a, um, a Twitter account, and he's always all the time tweeting the the Tower Ravens, Ooh. and they are hilarious. Yeah, it, it's a lot. I, I think it's Raven Master. His handle, I, I believe, is Raven Master One. Cool. Thank you. So, so go go and follow him because he's a he's a charming man, and uh, the ravens are very very cool. Thank you very much. Sure. Hi, I'm Olivia. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, how do you pronounce the exclamation points in the uh, whale and dolphins uh, naming conventions? It's a click. I think it's a click, like in uh, the Chosa language. Okay. The, so I can't. I can't do it correctly myself. Okay. But uh, that would that would be it. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to know. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Hi. My name's Andrea. Hi. Um, so uh, at this weekend, a bunch of people have mentioned uh, the Big Meow and also the Feline Wizards books in general. Um, and also that at least in the past, Warner still had the rights to them. Um, yeah. Could you give us an update on the pot potentiality of having ebooks of the Big Meow or of the first two? I'd really like that. Meow, we have some ongoing problems. We've had three database crashes to do with the subscribers lists and I'm trying to get all our subscribers handled before I do anything further about that. The person who was acting as administrator for that work uh, kind of went away under annoying circumstances and things were left in quite a bad state that I've been having to try to pull back together myself. Anyway, that's that story, but I'm not going to put Meow back in, in ebook status until I get the other two. Warner, we have approached them to revert the books. No news. I have no news for you. We uh, got onto them the first time about this about six months ago, and I haven't heard anything. And this is not unusual. Very often, the rights end at a publisher can be very, very leisurely in getting back to you. So, you know, I can't do anything about it right now, but it's, de it's definitely on the radar. I would like to get them out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sure, no problem. I'm Amanda. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, this has been bothering me for over a decade. <laughs> um, ever since Deep Wizardry. I was wondering why if Sri told Kit that his warning signs of rejection from the whale sark were his losing whale language and acting more human, why is it that he in the end acts a lot more whale-like and um, loses human language and is still rejected by the whale sark? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> that may be what what we, in technical terms, refer to as a mistake. <laughs> okay. All right. It could it could be. I really I need I need to look at it because I saw someone mentioning the issue a week or so ago, and I I sort of looked at that and went, that was hmm. I need to take a look at that. So I will I will take a look at that. There are mistakes in these books. Okay. Well, that is good to know. Here and there. <laughs> God forbid I should mention where they were. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, no problem. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, so I have two questions. Hi. The first is you used to work in animation, so I was wondering if um, you what your favorite animated like feature film or like short um, series was, or if you Ooh. had if you have one. That's, God, that's a tough call. I would have to think about that for a while. Um, everything that Pixar has done recently, I love. Everything. Um, of the more <laughs> classical modes of animation, 
One that I will usually drop what I'm doing to watch, even though I, I'm pretty sure we have it on CD, is uh, Prince of Egypt, uh, yeah, which is good. one of the most beautiful films, uh, just physically gorgeous, that, that I know. Um, as for series, um, there's so much to choose from. Um, I'm not real wild about a lot of the series that are sort of new out at the moment. Some of their animation styles are a little too bizarre for me. Um, though, the, though I understanding the, I understand the storytelling is brilliant in some of them. I just, you know, they, they kind of make my eyes hurt. Um, and that's, you know, nothing to say that they're bad. It's just my eyes are, you know, differently oriented maybe at my age than, than they were when I was younger. Uh, series that I have been very fond of gargoyles, certainly, you know, writing for it helps. Um, trying to think of something a little bit more current. I'm drawing a blank right now. It's just, you know, the time of day. I'll answer this online if I can. If I have some time to think about it, I'll put something up on the Tumblr. Cool. And the sure. second question I had was, you. one of the things I really love about Young Wizards is how different your alien species are. Like, it is to date the only time I've ever seen sentient, like, foliage anything. So I was wondering where exactly you got the inspiration for that, or, like, where, like, um how exactly you like put those species together? I, I, I think I just have to blame the general science fiction background on it and that I read a lot of writers, especially like Jim White, who did the Sector General books, um, and, you know, Isaac Asimov, and uh, uh, the Doc Smith books in particular, the Lensman books, they were always really good with weird aliens. Um, and a lot of that sort of school of mind hangs over what I'm doing. Uh, the idea that especially um, there are going to be a lot of, of uh, life forms based on other than carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to sort of wrap our brains around what that will look like or how that could look. Um, Asimov, in particular, did some books in the uh, sort of 60s and 70s about the logic of building aliens based on other kinds of, of uh, matter substrates. Uh, he was very big on silicon. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's just, you know, these are tropes that were very common to hard science fiction in the period when I was, you know, devouring it in my late teens and, and in high school. So a lot of that stuff has, has stayed with me. Um, and it's kind of fun to think, okay, okay, you know, sentient talking trees, how do we, how do we wangle that? <laughs> and then start trying to make sense out of it uh, in, in something that may not be the hardest science fiction. It's like soft science fiction, if anything. But it's, you know, you explore it deeply enough so that you can satisfy people's urges to understand how this works, and then you can move on to what really matters, which is how these species interact with other species. Um, there are some writers who did brilliant, brilliant stuff. Who was it? was Jim Bain, I think who wrote uh, a story called The Dance of the Changer and the Three that would simply turn your brain around in your skull in terms of the, the psychology of it being so bizarre. And I look back at that and go, wow, if you want to write aliens, write them like that. Jeez, that's so odd. Uh, also, Carol and Cherry, CJ Cherry does good aliens. So uh, she and I, uh, when we've had a chance, have often sat down and talked alien physiology at, at long, you know, great length and, and much in much detail. Carolyn gives extremely good alien, both at the psychology and at the uh, physiology end. So her, her stuff is worth reading for um, examples of why I do what I do. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Brighton. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one in uh, the mobiles world is mentioned as being significantly farther away from Earth uh, in terms of light years than the universe is old. Uh, it's very far away. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, trillion. Yeah, it's trillions of light years away, and the universe is billions of years old. How does that work? 
<laughs> with great difficulty. <laughs> I think this may be one of these uh, possibly mythical mistakes we're talking about. <laughs> Let's just all agree that it's really far away. And then oh, okay, out. that works. <laughs> and uh, other question, are we ever going to see anything more in the Omnitopia Dawn universe? <laughs> I can't discuss it. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, there's legal stuff going on. I can't discuss it. So, all right. Sorry about that. Thank you. Your books changed my life. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I have a moment. Just uh, we are coming to the end of our time scheduled. We have a lot more hands raised. Um, the only thing scheduled after this is lunch. So we technically could keep going, Diane, if you're okay with that. Um, and if you guys are not too hungry. <laughs> okay, well, here's here's the deal. I have uh, an agreement to be somewhere else moderately soon now. Why don't we let this run for another 10 minutes? And, uh, you know, that'll give me time to do what I have to do and uh, get back here for the next thing. Sounds great. Okay, who's had their hand up for, like, more than 10 minutes that I haven't seen? Someone? Red shirt. Red shirt? Uh, somebody's pointing at red shirt. You. 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 Come <laughs> Didn't feel like 10 minutes to me, but I'm not going to turn down the opportunity to ask a question. Hi, I'm Hugh. Hi. Hi. Two questions, a short one and a long one. The short one, how do you pronounce the customary hello and goodbye in the speech? Dice to ho. Thank you. <laughs> and the, the long one is... In Wizard's Dilemma, Anita is healing her mother, and Tom or Carl talks to her about how the wizardry needs to be done for her mom and not for her own sake. But she also heals her whatever, whatever makes her need glasses and astigmatism, I think. Can you talk about what the limits are on like healing oneself or changes to oneself versus to others? Um... When you're operating on someone else, you know, your major concern is is their primacy over their body. Mm -hmm. All right. When you're working on your own self, it's your own business, but you just better be sure you've got it right. <laughs> uh, it would be really, really bad, for example, if in the process of, you know, fixing your nearsightedness, uh, you did something, you know, in in shortening your eyeball. You shortened it too far and left yourself with astigmatism or something worse. Or your retina fell off. <laughs> um, you really need to be sure of what you're doing. Um, there's a bit, I think, in one of the 30-day uh, uh, OTPs where uh, Kit and Nita go off to a black market body legger and get themselves <laughs> sex changed. And it get, they get stuck. <laughs> and it's a bit of a problem. And I believe that uh, Tom's take on it is, look, he says, I think to Carl, he says, look, as if you didn't do something like this at that age yourself. Come on. <laughs> uh, there's, you know, people are always going to be experimenting with wizardry and, you know, seeing what they could pull off. Because, you know, God, it can't be always you know, just out of the rule book, you know, there has to be some fun going on and some experimentation and, um, you know, the powers are fine with that. Their, their feeling is fine. Just don't screw yourself up in some way you can't fix. Uh, if you're going to do, uh, you know, gender work on yourself or, or whatever, you need to be clear that, you know, you're, you're, clear about what you want to do, why you want to do it, and how it should be done. And I think I have suggested somewhere or another in the meta that there are wizards who specialize in this kind of thing. And the intention is not gatekeeping. The intention is not screwing your body up in some way that cannot afterwards be repaired. Uh, there will always be DIY experts. And there will always be DIY experts who have to go to someone later on for assistance in adjusting something that didn't quite go to plan. 
so, you know, it, it's the, the powers will say, fine, do your thing. Just don't come whining to us when your eyeball falls out next week. <laughs> Because you knew where the specialists are in the manual. It said, look, here's a guy who specializes in eyeballs not falling out. <laughs> but did you go to her? No. So, you know, now you're just going to have to be embarrassed. You know, it's a very small increase of entropy, but it still counts. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Sure. Thank you. I'm Dana. Um, Hi. I've heard you say before that um, there will only be audiobooks of Millennium Editions and some of the things that are only in ebook right now if you read them yourself. Um, have you hmm. considered possibly doing a crowdfunding solution? Uh, I know that I would be willing to put quite a bit of money into that. Yeah. <laughs> it would be awesome. I'll tell you, um, I resist that a little bit, partly because of the, the crap that happened surrounding the Big Meow, which just turned into such a garbage fire at one point. It was, it was embarrassing, personally. So I really resist the crowdfunding end of things. I have been flirting with the idea of a Patreon, though. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. I've been flirting with that, and I, I just sort of need to think a little bit. Oh, is this, this is interest, is it? Okay, I'm, I'm flirting harder now. Um, it, no, it's, it's been on my radar, and I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, the, the issue being right now that I don't want to overextend myself. There's a lot of other junk going on in my life personally and, and uh, uh, just in terms of work and the business surrounding work. Uh, I think if there's going to be any crowdfunding, it will be a little bit in the future. But as I say, the Patreon model, that, that's something else. Um, you know, if people are willing just, you know, to sort of keep me eating for short work, I, I, I think that's an excellent notion, you know. <laughs> I'm a bit fond of food um, and air. <laughs> and, you know, and the other things that you have to do to, to survive. Um, needless to say, you know, there's someone else in the house who's busy with the same thing, and I like to keep him eating as well. He gets awfully cranky if you take his food away. Yeah. So uh, it's 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 on it's on the list. Uh, now, while I'm thinking of it, I just want to mention in passing. Uh, I mentioned this to the convention committee when we were chatting the other day. Uh, I'll be popping another ebook probably late next week if the timing works correctly. This will be Interim Errantry Two. Uh, the working title is On Ordeal. And we get to look closely at the ordeals of Roshan. Uh, <laughs> Manvish and uh, Ronan. Uh, now, the, the issue is going to be whether I can finish up my editing quickly enough uh, in the next week or so. Uh, to actually pop it next week. I have another thing going on as well, which is making my timing difficulty uh, a bit a bit crazed. Now, this far I will go. For those who want to pre-purchase it, I'll put up a link so you can do that. Essentially, it's possible to do an advanced purchase the way you do it at Amazon, where you go to the ebook store, you know, you pay the money, and the the store registers your purchase and sends you a document which will, when the book is ready, be replaced automatically by the new, by, by the ebook. So I'll put up a link of, to that for people uh, from the Tumblr uh, in an, an hour or two. So you can go look at the cover. There's a rough of the cover. It's very rough. I mean, it's not, doesn't have all the bells and whistles hung on it in terms of special effects that, that need to be there as yet. But these stories are going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Roshan's is hysterical in, in Diane, a moment. various ways. Can we uh, post Yo. about this on Tumblr, or is this waiting for your announcement online? 
Uh, why don't you wait? It's only going to take me a couple hours to, well, not even a couple hours. I'll, I'll have it handled before the, the panel. Um, I just need to, you know, sit down here and, and, uh, uh, that I've, I've got the, the cover stored as a draft at the moment. Um, I'll tell you what, um, all right, it's just going for two more questions. 530 for us. Uh, let, let's handle a couple more questions and then I'll, I'll deal with the logistics of this. Anyway, if, if I don't actually have this thing ready by the panel, I'll, I'll get it ready after the panel and then pop it. And then, you know, you can announce formally on, on the, you know, wherever you please, and we can take it from there. Fantastic. So we have two more questions. Okay. Thing about the uh, Dorinta series. <laughs> mm. Hi, I'm Liz. Hi. Hi. Um, two things, one really quick and one slightly quick. Um, so in Games Wizard Play, uh, Callahan's unfavorable instigation was called something else. Is that a direction change or is that one of those mythical mistakes? <laughs> let's, let's just call it a, a difference in translation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it. That's the ticket, yeah. Um, you know, this is one of these things. Sometimes when you're writing, you're in the heat of writing, you say, God, what was that thing called? And you put something in there. And then because it's spelled correctly, no one from your editor, through the copy editor, through you, through the people you have reading the thing, you know, no one picks it up. And then you open a book, you know, the next year, and you go, oh, it's such a pretty book. Look at this. Oh, shit. <laughs> I think the most famous one of those I did was uh, in Dark Mirror, where Worf is talking about this opera. And because I couldn't, I, I, I was too busy actually writing that particular sequence to think of a name for the opera. So I just put in X and Y. <laughs> and that's like shit. That's the name of the opera, X and Y. I think we have to assume that it's something very, very counterculture and peculiar, like Peak Dom or something like that. Um, something, something like, you know, neo modernist in, in Klingon culture, X and Y. Mm. So I. Anyway. There's a line I think is in Deep Wizardry of when talking about, you know, what's the potential effects of Nita breaking the oath. And there's a line about, you know, you know, after all, everybody thinks it's normal to have an unnamed pit in the bottom of your soul. And I've struggled with depression for most of my life, so I just want to say thank you for that line. For you know, it really hit me sure. that you're not alone. So you're very welcome. <laughs> so okay, what do we got? This is the last question. Okay, so. Hi, I'm Jenny, and okay. actually kind of on that not alone note, I wanted to start by thanking you for listening because she meant so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, it's, it's a pleasure. Yeah, but so related to that, Lisa talks about her special one, her significant other. Um, number one, she doesn't use gendered terms that I've seen. Um, does she have a girlfriend, a boyfriend? Is her significant other non-binary? Um, and will we meet? this significant other in the future, do you know? Probably because I've given this no thought whatsoever. <laughs> I just, every now and then, you know, sometimes when you're writing dialogue, the, you just hear the voice of the character saying X, all right? It just flows out like that. I have no idea who that person is, <laughs> you know? And, and this is unusually normal. <laughs> You'd be surprised how often this kind of stuff happens. Or a character, you know, is a, a, just, you know, a line of dialogue will come out and then you'll stop and you'll go, what? <laughs> yeah. um, and usually you either figure it out by main force. You know, you just sit down and consider the problem until it resolves itself. Or it just comes to you suddenly. You're somewhere else. You're sitting on the loo. You're doing the dishes. And, and then suddenly you realize what you meant by that. And you go, oh, God, I'm so slow. And then you move on from there. Uh, it, it, it's an interesting thing. I had one of the neighbors say to me one day, you know, it, it looks like hard work what you do. And you're always working. I said, you have no idea. I mean, this, this job appears to have a lot of freedom associated with it. But the truth is you are never off the clock, ever, ever, ever. 
off the clock. You're always thinking a story in the back of your head. Um, you can be doing anything, things of great importance. And at the same time, you know, the little voice will speak to you saying, you know that one paragraph where you couldn't think of the word? I finally thought of the word. And you're going, oh, stop now. <laughs> um, and it won't, it won't let you rest. It will wake you up in the middle of the night. This is a merciless career to be in. You, know, you just get to kiss goodbye to ever being able to leave your work at home again. You can't. Now, that's it. There are rewards. But you just have to be really clear about the... Both yeah. parents are authors, so I do know that a little bit from watching them growing up. Um, so I was also yeah. going to ask if um, this is significant other, if that was a romantic or queer platonic relationship, but I'm guessing, based on everything you've just said, that you don't have an answer to that, so I'm just going to thank you again so much for everything. You're very welcome. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So I will see you in a while at the panel. Yes. And we will discuss trebuchets and other, <laughs> other minor issues. Fantastic. Oh. That's great. So see you later. We will see you shortly. Right up. <laughs>